economics alone cannot explain this attitude. For though the economic consequences of death differ from those of non-life, they are not so different as to explain this difference in attitude. So what is it? Why does Kingsley Davis, one of the world's great demographers, respond to U.S. population growth during the 1960s, quote, I have never been able to get anyone to tell me why we needed those additional 23 million, close quote. And why does Paul Ehrlich say, quote, I can't think of any reason for having more than 150 million people in the U.S., and no one has ever raised one to me, close quote. By 1991, he and Ann Ehrlich had even lowered the ceiling. Quote, no reasonable, pardon me, no sensible reason has ever been given for having more than 135 million people. He is wrong, but Ehrlich bets what he thinks will be the economic gains that we and our descendants might enjoy against the unborn's very lives. Would he make the same sort of wager if his own life rather than others' lives were at stake? Chapter 39 has more to say about the morality of betting other people's lives. I do not say that society should never trade off human life for animals or even for non-living things. Indeed, society explicitly makes exactly this trade-off when a firefighter's life is lost by protecting a building or a forest or a zoo. And neither I nor hardly anyone else says it should not be so. And I have no objection in principle to the community taxing its members for the cost of parks or wilderness or wildlife protection, although a private arrangement may be better, any more than I object to taxes for the support of the poor. But according to my values, we should, number one, have a clear quantitative idea of the trade-offs we seek to make rather than make them on some unquantified principle such as the loss of a single human being or a single non-human species or animal is obscene. Implying that the costs of saving that entity should not be reckoned. Two, recognize that Economic science does not show that a greater number of human beings implies slower economic development or a lower standard of living in the long run. And three, understand that foregoing the births of additional human beings is costly according to the value systems of some other human beings. Changes in the intellectual environment since the first edition. Most of the above appeared in the preface to the first edition, the common attitude towards the environment in the past decade, however, impels me to add the following personal note. People who call themselves environmentalists sometimes say to people like me, you don't appreciate nature. Such remarks often are made knowing little of the other person. Given the personal nature of such attacks, perhaps a few words of information are in order for at least this one representative person. I'll bet I spend more hours of the year outdoors than any staff members of the environmental organization whose job is not specifically outdoors. I'm outside about nine hours a day, perhaps, 140 days a year, every day that is not too cold for me to work. On average, only about one afternoon a year is too hot for me to be outside, shirtless and in shorts with a fan blowing and a ridiculous looking wet napkin on top of my head. I am comfortable outside if the temperature is less than 95 or even 100 degrees. Does this not show some appreciation of the out of doors? Two pairs of binoculars are within reach to watch the birds. I love to check which of the tens of species of birds that come to sup from the mulberry tree behind our house will arrive this year and I never tired of watching the hummingbirds at our feeder. I'll match my bird watching time with just about any environmentalist, and I'll bet that I've seen more birds this spring than most of your environmental friends. And I can tell you that Jeremy Rifkin 
is spectacularly wrong when he writes that a child grows up in the U.S. Northeast without hearing birds sing nowadays. There are more different birds around now than there were 45 years ago when I first started watching them. The mulberry tree is a great attraction, of course.